Hello everyone, we're here to talk about citations and referencing, perhaps not the most exciting of uh, subjects. However, acknowledging your sources is absolutely key to success, especially at university level. However, increasingly, exam boards expect A-level and IB students to reference very accurately and also to show a kind of critical awareness of their sources and to interrogate them. So what are we doing today? Firstly, we're going to look at why we reference. I've done another screencast about plagiarism, so I'm only going to touch on this quite briefly. Most of today is going to be looking at Harvard referencing, which is the uh, referencing system that we encourage most people to use in our college. Uh, we're also going to look at what a reference list is and a bibliography. I'm going to give you a little uh, exercise to do on Harvard referencing. And then finally, I'm going to give you a screencast which we prepared on how to use RefMe, a piece of citation software that would uh, save you a great deal of time. And we'll conclude with some tips of how to make sure that your references are accurate and that you will score the maximum marks that you can, or if you're going on to university, that you will be able to do this accurately. I thought I'd start today by looking at three quick articles. One is about a media psychiatrist, Professor Raj here, who admitted that he plagiarized articles from other academics. The second is an article about Coldplay, who apparently plagiarized an American band. And the third is an author claiming that uh, Harry Potter, in fact, was plagiarized from his book, Willie the Wizard. This shows you just how important the idea of ideas is in the modern world and how people want to have their ideas acknowledged. So it reminds us, doesn't it, of how important it is that we acknowledge where we get our ideas, our facts and our statistics from. So why do we use referencing? Well, a few points. It shows genuine reading research of the field. And by field here, I mean the expert field, whether that be psychology, philosophy, biochemistry, whatever it is. We're expected in academia to show that we are aware of what has been written in this particular field. We have to, as I said before, credit ideas to um, authors and researchers. This is very important because this is how they make their money. Um, it allows people to check and trace your ideas, trace them back to the sources and make sure that you've done this accurately. For other people who want to write an essay or, or want to do some research in your field, it, you're giving them shortcuts that they can use in the library or on the internet. Um, and I'm going to show you in a moment how I use Wikipedia in this particular way. It's very much a standard requirement of all academic writing to reference your, uh, your sources. Scholarship, after all, is difficult and rigorous, and it is meant to be. You're meant to show that you have done the work in your particular field. If we have a quick little look at this cartoon, Jimmy has been told off, you can't cite Wikipedia as the main source for your assignment. Well, I'd certainly agree with that because we know that Wikipedia is open to public editing. However, I'm going to quickly show you that Wikipedia is extremely useful for sourcing. Here's one of my favorite um, theorists, uh, Lev Vygotsky, who writes a lot about psychology and about education in particular. Now, if I were to write a university essay and cite Wikipedia, then I'd be in a lot of trouble, as this, um, uh, this uh, uh, message here shows us. It says this article has multiple issues. Please help improve it or discuss these issues on the talk page. This just shows you how Wikipedia cannot be seen as reliable in this sense. However, as I've shown my classes before, at the bottom of Wikipedia, there's something which is absolutely invaluable, and that's a list of references. In many cases, there are actually links to the PDFs that you can use. Now, these references are genuine, and they give you the shortcuts that I mentioned earlier and they save you, uh, you know, hours, if not weeks, if not months, in many cases. So for research writers and EPQ students, this is a superb resource that you should use and that you could use for your references because they are genuine references. In many cases, they're links to highly academic articles. 
Now, there are so many citation styles, and this is the great difficulty of doing any kind of talk or lecture like this. Um, in my master's degree, I used the Modern Humanities Research Association method, and I'm a student of English literature and philosophy. So in the UK, that's quite standard. Uh, in the EPQ at the moment, we're teaching the Harvard system, often known as the author date system. The Chicago system is very big, especially in the United States as is the Modern Language Association um, referencing method. And then there's the APA, the American Psychological Association. And then there's so many others. Um, a particularly uh, important one is the Oxford one. Now, in this uh, screencast, I will not have time to go into how to use footnotes. And I'm going to be concentrating instead on the, on the Harvard system, which doesn't allow footnotes because it uses in-text citation. I think I would do a different screencast if you want to use footnotes. Now, a lot of what I'm taking today comes from Imperial College's citing and referencing Harvard style manual. I've included the, um, the link over here if you want to go to it. It's far more detailed, as you can see from this slide over here. Uh, here's all of the, uh, the things that they cover. I have taken um, quite a bit of this. Um, but I've made it so that we are looking at the key information rather than the very difficult, complex and nuanced bits. So I do recommend that you go and have a look at this. As I say, here is the link here. And I would like to credit and to thank Imperial University for providing this for me. Um, I very much want to acknowledge them as a source in order to model for you the fact that we have to uh, show the origins of our research. And in this particular case, I'm borrowing a great deal from Imperial University. So what is referencing? It's a method to demonstrate to your readers that you've conducted a thorough and appropriate literature search and reading. And it goes into two parts, the citing and the reference list. What is a citation? Well, when you use another person's work, you must acknowledge it. OK, and this is called the citation. In the Harvard style, your citation includes the author or the editor of the cited work and the year of publication of the cited work. Now, that is within your essay itself, as I will show you. So how do you reference in your EPQ report? Well, in the, in the body of the text is the name and the date, as I just said. Okay, And the full reference only appears in the reference section at the end, which many people refer to as a bibliography. OK, so here you see focusing your life solely on making a buck shows a certain poverty of ambition. It also shows too little of yourself because it's only when you hitch your wagon to something later than yourself that you realize your true potential. This is a quotation taken from Barack Obama. OK, one problem with this slide actually is a direct quotation like that should actually have a page number over there. But you get the idea. The author's name and the date must appear within the body of your essay itself. At the end, you can put down the entire reference. Now, within the Oxford system, uh, this is where you're able to use footnotes, you would do something more like this. In the body of the text as a note, you would simply put a number. Now, if you're using a non-Mac computer, you can use the keys alt Control f and that will automatically uh, create footnotes for you. Within a Mac, you'd insert a footnote, and then you will get a number. And what you see here is the number one is down here. And then at the bottom of the page, you would put down Obama, the year, and everything of where it comes from there, OK? So that's the Oxford system. But I, as I said, I was thinking about making a different screencast for this one because it will be simply too long otherwise. How do we reference an eBay source? Well, here you can see this would be at the end of the essay and the references of the bibliography. You would put down the author name, the full title of the document in quote marks, the title of the complete work if that's applicable. So if it comes from a bigger book, you would need to put down the title of the book as well, or a larger, you know, electronic book, that is. The full HTTP address, the URL. Now, a lot of students simply put down the URL and they think that's enough. It's not. And it's very important I stress this. 
and tell you that you should do everything that you can to trace the author. Only then, if you can't find the author, can you leave the author out. You have to put down the date of the publication, and once again, you have to do some detective work sometimes to find that out. And most importantly, you need to put down the date that you accessed um, this particular website. And the reason for that being is, I'm sure you're all aware that websites have constantly been updated. If someone were to go and check one of your references and the website is completely different, you'd have to be able to show that you had actually used that website and that's how you do it by putting down the date that you access the particular website. Now, for much of the rest of the screencast, what I'm going to do is go through some of the different conventions of the Harvard system. And I'm going to begin by saying, we've seen already how you can cite one author, but how do you cite two authors or three authors, okay? So, if we have a look at the first example, Recent research indicates that the number of duplicate papers being published is increasing. Irami and Gardner. So if you have two authors, you put both of their names down and you put them down in alphabetical order. Let's have a look at three then. Evidence shows that providing virtual laboratory exercises as well as practical laboratory experience enhances the learning process. Here we have Barros, Reed and Verdijo. 2008. So three authors means that all three of them uh, get mentioned. How does that change when we have four authors? Well, here we go. If the work has four authors, we tend to use the abbreviation et al, which means and others, and it should be used after the first author's name. So let's have a look at how that would work. Social acceptance of carbon capture and storage is necessary for the introduction of technologies. Van Alphen et al. 2007. So as I say, the et al. allows us to know that there are other authors whom you can look up. Um, this is simply because you can't have too many authors. It would start to look clumsy after a while. And there are academic papers where you have up to, say, eight or even ten authors. And that's where using the abbreviation et al is very useful. Now citing, um, this is a particularly tough one because you might get an author who's written a, a number of, they might be a prolific writer and they've done a number of researches or written a number of books in the same year. So what do you do? Well, you use a lowercase letter so that you're able to differentiate the two works. So let's, how does this work? Here's an example. Communication of science in the media has increasingly come under focus, particularly where reporting of facts and research is inaccurate. Goldacre 2008A and Goldacre 2008B. Now this means that Goldacre has written two um, papers on this particular subject, the communication of science in the media. And um, as I say, it may be that he's even written three or four or she, uh, so we have to use these letters here, the A, B, and possibly the C, to distinguish these different um, works. Now, in the reference list or the bibliography at the end, you would also need to use the A and the B to show that these are works in the same year, and that makes identification of them easier. Now, moving on. Now, secondary referencing. I often get asked this by students, okay? What do we do if we want to quote somebody, but we haven't directly read their work? We've read their work in somebody else's essay or report, okay? So we call the secondary reference or secondary citation, okay? So it may be that you were unable to find the original work, or it may be that you came to someone's ideas through somebody else. So this happens a lot. So this is what you do. According to Caluzzi and Papagello, 2005, as cited by Holding et al. 2008, most patients given opiates do not become addicted to such drugs. So the cited by over here shows us that we haven't read this essay directly. We've read this essay and Holding quotes them. Now, universities on the whole prefer it if you read the original source. 
but there are times where this may not be possible. And that is when you use the term cited by, thus showing to the reader that you haven't directly gone and read this particular essay. You've read it via holding et al. Very important there that you show that you didn't go to the original source because it is possible that holding has not uh, summarized the work of Pelusi and Papagello very well. And it's up to you to show that you haven't read it directly. Now, moving on, let's not forget as well, um, images, illustrations, tables, diagrams, photos, figures, pictures also need references and students forget those. So if we take a diagram off the internet, if we take a graph, etc., we also need to use an in-text citation for that. And here's how you do it. Table illustrating checklist of information for common sources, peers and shields, okay? So you need to show where that diagram came from or where that um, photograph came from or where that picture or where that table came from. You've got to treat these visual images as you would any other source. So I urge you to think of them not as something that you can simply put into your essay because there can be bias and difficulties especially when it comes to things like tables and graphs, etc. Now, using a direct quotation, so you've read the paper, you've found something in it you really want to quote, you think it's really interesting, okay? First of all, you need to use single quotation marks, okay? Unless it's a quote from somebody. So if you were to say, quote me, and you said, oh, Flynn said the following, you would put double quotation marks in. But if you're simply quoting my academic paper and you're saying in this paper, Flynn said the following, then you would use single quotation marks. OK, if you're using a direct quote, it's also important that you state the page number as well as the year. So say, for instance, here, Simon Menzies and Matthews 2001 state that the principle of effective stress is imperfectly known and understood by many practicing engineers, page four. Now, because you provided a quote, it, the convention is that you also provide a page number. So in things like academic reports and in EPQ reports, this is absolutely key if you're looking to get nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 for your use of sources. Now, citing works uh, with no obvious author, and this is something that often happens on the internet in particular, okay? If you need to cite a piece of work which does not have an obvious author, you should use what is called a corporate author. For example, many online publications will not have individually named authors. And here's an example. A national strategy is creating a framework to drive improvements in dementia services. Department of Health 2009. And you'll often get this with um, government publications. They don't credit individuals because they want you to see them as the voice of the government. And therefore, you might have to uh, quote a government department, be it the Department of Health, the Department of Education, etc., etc. This is also the case with many corporations, of course. Now, here are a few tips for the effective use of quotations. Quotations longer than two lines should be inserted as separate in an indented paragraph. Here's an example. Smith, 2004, summarizes the importance of mathematics to society in the knowledge economy, stating that, and here comes our long quote. So we leave that space. We use the colon over there to indicate that a long quote is to follow. We put down the page number at the end of the quotes. Make sure that you use the single quotation marks to show that that's a direct quotation from the paper. Now, if you're using a longer quotation like this, it's very important that it's key to your argument and that you go on in the rest of your report to talk about this quotation and to analyze it. This is a key moment for you to maybe use the idea of critical evaluation and perhaps challenge or modify uh, what a critic has said in their quotation. So once again, if you're going to use a quote of that length, make sure that it's absolutely key to your argument. 
So how do I uh, write a, a, a reference? Okay, so for all types of references, the key bits of information are the author or the editor, the date of the publication or the broadcast or the recording, and the title of the item. Okay. Now, what you're going to find is, and this is when you're doing the references at the end, unfortunately, especially in this multimodal age that we live in, where you might be looking at emails, journal articles, newspapers, websites, web pages, TV broadcasts, personal interviews, book chapters, etc., there are many ways of referencing them. Most of the time, most of you will be using book articles or uh, book chapters, or you might be looking on the internet. But what I've done is I've provided this table to help you, um, uh, to give you guidelines on how to do referencing at the end. Now, of course, this is something that you can come and see uh, your coordinator or one of your supervisors about if you wanted to get more details on this particular subject of how to do the references at the end. Now, depending on the type of material you want to reference, you may need other things, things like the volume number. You may need to know um, if you've used a conference title, etc. That's unusual for you. It's perhaps more likely that you're going to be needing the URL. And if it's an academic paper, many academic papers have what we call a D OI, a digital object identifier. And that can usually be found on the website that you take the article from. If you are going to use um, citation software like RefMe or PaperPile, then in many cases the software put a lot of this information in for you. And that's the value of using the software. So how is it that you write a reference list? Well, this is your list of sources that have been cited in the assignment. Obviously, it comes at the end. Um, as I said before, I'm going to use the term reference list and bibliography interchangeably. And the list includes, as I say, books, journals listed in one list, not in separate lists, according to the source type. So you'd simply um, put them all together in one list. And it should be alphabetical by author or editor. But remember, I did say in some cases you may not be able to find the author, but do try. Uh, books, paper, electronic journals, etc. are written in a particular format that must be followed. Your reference list contains all the items that you've cited or quoted from. And that includes things like interviews if you're doing primary research. When you've used more than one piece of work by the same author in your reference list, you should list the works in order of date. So say you've used Flynn and he wrote in 2010, then he wrote in 2011, 2015. They should go in date order, 2010, 2011, 2015. Maybe that you referred to a particular author up to three or four times or even more. Now, I won't go through this too much, but this is what your references will look like. You can see that they are in alphabetical order. Here's Goldacre, uh, Henderson, Holding, Piers, uh, Romalo, and Simons. Uh, we have the date following the name. You can see that we have the uh, title of the particular publication. We write down all the necessary information that we need. And also, very importantly, because I've used an internet source here, according to the Harvard method, we have to put down the date that we access that. So in this case, it says accessed on the 18th of June, 2015. Now, I'm just going to go on to this and say that there will this uh, PowerPoint will be accompanied. Um, you'll get access to this. Here's an interesting uh, little exercise that you can do to see that you've remembered the stuff today. And this is extremely important and will require you to go onto a particular screencast. There is a citation software and there's a number of types of citation software. This particular one is called RefMe. Here is a screencast that has been prepared by Mr. Anderson and it will show you how to use RefMe. 
Now, if you're able to use RefMe and you are able to use it without paying for it, it's extremely valuable and will save you a huge amount of time in terms of laying out the references for you. As you can see from today's lecture, it's extremely complex the way that this works. And therefore, any tools that can help you, uh, you should use as much as possible. So I'm going to conclude now by going through a number of top tips for referencing. Firstly, keep your reference list as you go along. You can see how much work it is if you need to start looking for things. Uh, use RefMe or another piece of software if you know one. And if you're able to pay for one, that would be even better. Keep a careful record of page numbers, chapters, etc. in your notes. I can't stress this enough. It will help you a great deal. Make sure that you have the correct dates for everything and that you've not confused different publications up. Keep a record as well, as we've seen, of the date that you access websites. This is extremely important because the websites, as I say, are often changing. And file your notes carefully. Try and use themes, etc., to organize them, color code them, put them into files. The better organized your notes are, the easier your referencing will be. Now, I hope you found this very useful. There's so much more to say about referencing, but for our purposes today, I feel that we have covered most of the things. As I say, I think we will need a different screencast where we look at the use of footnotes. Thank you so much for listening.